trigger warning. This podcast is about grief. Whether you are newly bereaved or whether you have been stuck in grief for years, I do hope this podcast brings you some comfort. Grief is such a universal experience, but we all do it differently. This podcast is not about fixing you or forcing the healing process because there is no cure for grief. It can only be absorbed, experienced, loved and cared for. So whether you are doing it privately behind closed doors or like me, you are kicking and screaming your way through, let's support each other. This is a safe space where we can come together and share experiences. My hope is that this podcast shines a light on your path and gives you the strength to navigate your way through the grieving process. My name is Louise Bates and I'm so pleased we connected. I'm looking forward to interviewing people who have also walked this path to find out what worked for them in the hope that it helps you too. I'm sending you so much love and support and I look forward to sharing this crazy journey with you. Welcome to this episode of A Gift for Grief and today I am talking to Kate Tim who is one half of Coffin Club UK which is a funeral education platform and twice winner of the best funeral information provider at the Good Funeral Awards. Kate also works as a wedding and funeral celebrant. One of the reasons she is so passionate about what she does is through her own experience of loss with the death of her dad when she was just 13. She describes this as being pretty much the event that defined the rest of her life. Kate lives on the south coast with her husband and three daughters and today we meet for the first time over Zoom. So welcome Kate. Thank you, thank you for having me. Well, you're very welcome. So perhaps we could start with you telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yes. So um, I'm Kate T. I'm called Kate T because my partner in business crime is Kate D. Um, So we work together as funeral and wedding celebrants, Kate and Kate celebrants. But um, we also founded an organisation called Coffin Club because we were so frustrated um, about the state of funerals in the UK and how kind of um, cookie cutter and uh, templated they are. And we were aware of the fact that actually you can do anything. You can do anything you like to celebrate somebody's life. You can be wherever you like in a village hall or a back garden or a social club. Um, And we wanted to make everyone aware of that fact, not because we think that's the right way to do it, but because we want people to have choice. And if they then know all those choices and still say, I'd like 20 minutes at the crematorium, that's absolutely fine because that's an informed choice. Um, it's about, you know, getting people talking about these things. I think we're quite reluctant to <laughs> talk about our days. I think we're quite happy to talk about death in general, in abstract, <clears throat> in abstract, but we're less happy to talk about it, you know, as an actual, this is going to happen to us and we need to organise ourselves. Um So we also train celebrants because we think they're very key to this whole thing because celebrants can be really passionate about offering choices and about conducting services in different ways. So that's kind of what we do. Um, And as you say, uh, I unfortunately, my dad died when I was 13. He was um, 45. And... I do think that had a very um, defining role in my in my life. And um, the person I am is probably not the person I would have been if that hadn't happened. And I'm quite sure that um, that has given me an added degree of passion (laughs) for what I do. Um, because his funeral was utterly horrendous, not meaningful at all. Um, you know, not it, it was a family of atheists in a church 
not quite knowing what we were doing there um, with the classic, the vicar not getting my dad's name right. And obviously, because it's very heavily based on um, Christian doctrine in the church, which is fine if you're a Christian. But if you're not, it doesn't resonate at all. It was just, you know, I don't think we quite knew what we were doing there, but it was 1981 and that was what you were offered. Um, So I don't want anyone to be in that position when they're in the wrong place. They should be in the right place because it can really be part of the healing process or it can be part of um, making life really hard for you and not feeling that you had any agency or ownership over that which is how I felt I felt I was just swept along by something and none of it was anything to do with me and none of it made anything better for me it just made it all worse oh that's really sad that your dad didn't get the send-off that fitted with your family your family's beliefs well, it didn't fit with our family and beliefs and it didn't fit with him. You know, he was young. He was really charismatic. He yeah. was, um, you know, really active. He was part of the Lions Club and, you know, he did a lot. And the funeral service didn't reflect him at all. And yes, was not something we could relate to at all because yeah. we don't we didn't have that faith. I still don't have that faith. So it was just, yeah, it was a bit odd. (laughs) Oh, sad. Well, over the last few years, I've helped organise three funerals. And each one was very much a traditional Catholic church service, you know, followed by the service at the creme and then on to the wake. And I had no idea that there were other ways of doing it. You know, I just got guided by the local funeral director you know they told you when it was going to be and what date it was going to be and the time you know it was basically in their hands and you know I thought the only choices we had were with the readings choosing the hymns and what sort of coffin to go for Uh, and that was it but I think now why has it taken so long to move away from the traditional funeral parlour. I mean, even saying funeral parlour sounds so outdated, doesn't it? Well, yes. I mean, it kind of breaks my heart to hear you say that because, um, you know, I find it very frustrating when a family's gone to a funeral director before they've come to me and then <laughs> and then they're already kind of, yeah, it's 20 minutes of the creme, there's a song to go in, a song to go out and a song in the middle. When it could be so much more and you can separate the celebration of life from the committal bit, the cremation or the burial. And you could maybe have, you know, if you are um, Catholic and you want to have a Catholic uh, mass or whatever it is that you have, you can have that. But you can also have an additional, you know, non-religious celebration of life or you can you can mix and match. You can throw a bit of religion in, even if you don't have the full church service. I mean, we're very wedded to um, Victoriana when it comes to funerals. It's like, I think we had a a time where um, grief and mourning were almost like a fashionable thing in the Victorian era. You had chief mourners and there was, you dressed in black for a year and, you know, Um, You had memorial kind of trinkets and stuff. Um, And it's like we've become stuck with that. You know, the fact that funeral directors are often dressed like Dickensians. um, I don't quite know why that signifies respect, but it does. I don't quite know um, why we got stuck in that era, but we did. Um, And I think, you know, with then the dawn of the NHS and people no longer dying at home, they tended to die in hostel or be in a care home or another setting. Um, I think death just became separated from us and funeral directors um, who do a great job. And the reason they exist is because many of us don't want to do what they do. And also, I think... I would want a funeral director because I would want to be present on the day and 
um, enjoying the day, for want of a better word. I'd want to be present rather than being the organiser, being the one going, oh, has everybody got their order of service? Everyone sat down. Oh, where, when are the drinks coming? You know, so I think they play an important role, but I think they should be facilitators. I don't think they should say, here's package A, B or C, and you have to fit into it. Yeah. Um, that's not to say there aren't funeral directors who are brilliant and forward thinking, but I also think there are a lot who have package A, B or C. Um, yeah. So if if you were to know about that, then, you know, you can go to a funeral director and say, right, what I want is this. And then usually they will facilitate you. Yeah. Um, but they're less likely to actually tell you. I, I mean, that is my experience. I know other people will have other experiences, but that's my experience. Yeah. So it's an exciting time for the funeral industry, isn't it? Because there does seem to be a growing trend towards more personal and unique ceremonies that reflect the individuality of the diseased person. Um, yeah, I think so. Although I would say it's a very, you know, it's like a cruise liner. It's going to be a slow one to sort of turn around. But I think there will come a tipping point because every time... I conduct a uh, service in a what is called an alternative venue, but actually I'd like it to just be mainstream that, you know, if you said to me I went to a funeral on Friday, I would say, oh, where was it held? Rather than, oh, you went to the church or the creme or other place of worship. But if I've been in a barn or a village hall or a back garden and there's been like a really lovely flow because there's none of that waiting around before you go in then you go in then you'll speak in hushed tones because you're a little bit nervous and it's you know you're not you're uncomfortable about what's coming and you're scared about the curtains and you know all of that then that finishes you go back out you'll stand and shuffle around again because you're waiting for some sort of weird signal to you know show that you're going on to the next place if you're just in one setting you know, none of that happens. You can have the coffin there. It can already be in situ. People can approach it. You can have luggage tags or something so people can write notes or have a, a coffin where there's space to just write on it. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, a veneered wooden coffin. It can be cardboard or, um, you know, wicker with luggage tags. And that makes that a huge difference already that setting and that coffin being you know central to proceedings rather than up on a catafalque where you're scared to approach it and sometimes people don't even know they can approach it you know they'll say I didn't know I didn't know that I could yeah. go and have a little pat and say goodbye at the end and that's really sad you know it's your person you can do what you like so I just think that this knowledge is very empowering if people know that they can do stuff differently. It gives them it gives them permission to do something that is really meaningful. And also, I think I do think agency and ownership is very important that for you to feel you have done something as this final act of love um, is quite important rather than it, it being taken away from you which I know is done for the right reasons like oh let us take that burden from you but I'm not always sure that's actually the best thing and I see people sometimes at the crematorium you know the last time they saw their person they would just died and then the next time they see them because they haven't been to see them they're in a coffin and you can see that is like a punch in the gut for them it's it's awful so I just think being more hands-on to whatever degree you're comfortable with. I'm not suggesting everybody is really comfortable, you know, hanging out with their dead person. But some people, I think that's beneficial. And I think being given the opportunity to be as involved as you are comfortable with is actually a good thing. Yes, it's um, it sounds amazing when you put it like that. I mean, thinking of going back to my son's funeral, um, I would love to have gone up and kissed the coffin afterwards, but I felt like, oh, it's not the done thing. Oh. It very much, it was very, very formal. Yeah. And I remember when we were waiting to go into the crematorium, 
there was a long delay and nobody knew why there was a long delay. And I remember the funeral director sort of running around like headless chickens. And I'm thinking, what's going on? And then the main man came up to me and said, "Um, what's the format once we go inside? And I thought, well, I've told you what's happening. Luckily, I had a scrap piece of paper with a list of, you know, who was going to get up and say what and someone was going to get up and do a poem and somebody else was going to sing a song. So luckily, I had this scrap of paper that I gave to him. And I thought, surely, you know, we've had this conversation. I I, I was really surprised that that happened. That but I mean, terrible. having said all yeah. of this, it was a lovely day. I know it's hot. It sounds strange saying a funeral mm. can be lovely. Mm. It was a lovely mm. funeral. But there were parts to it, especially with the funeral operators, that I thought they could have been better. Yeah. Um, so it's really refreshing to speak to you to know that, you know, there are and these that's alternatives. very interesting because one of the things I say to the celebrants that we train is you would never, ever want a family to say that could have been better. And that's, that's just literally what you've just said, yeah. because that's, I, I, you know, you only get one chance to do this. You yeah. don't want to have regrets, do you? You really don't want to feel regret over over this thing no. that you have to do that is so hard and that you only have one one chance to get it right so I just think it's really important and I think it's not difficult it's not you know it's organizing an event and it's quite a simple event so all you need is to really communicate with people to find out what would be meaningful to them what additional things could you have? Do you want the family dog there? You know, do you want um, live music? You know, if it's if it's meaningful, you know, not just we have a song to go in, a song to go out, a song in the middle and a poem. Well, not everyone even likes poems. Why would everyone suddenly have a poem and a generic poem? You know, I think as a celebrant, your job is to have found out so much about that person that you can add in additional stuff and that you don't need any padding. You don't need to stick something in just because. It should all be about reflecting that person. Yeah. So do you have people come to you who want to organise their own funerals or, or are you dealing with people who have lost a loved one and they want some guidance? Um, it, usually it's um, after somebody has died, their important person will come to us either directly or via a funeral director. They'll ask for us. Um, there are instances where we will work with someone who's still alive. Um, so I, I've done quite a few uh, funerals where the person has had a degree of planning it themselves um but ultimately I do think a funeral is for the people who are left behind I think the emerging trend in living funerals that's been in the press quite a lot recently I I slightly struggle with because I think actually I, I, I'm not saying it's wrong, but for me, I I struggle with it a little bit. I kind of think, would I really want that? And would I want to put my children through that, having to publicly sort of <laughs> be there with me there, knowing that I'm going to die? I find the whole thing slightly, I, I have difficulty with it. I do see it as more for, you know, it's honouring the person who's died, but it's actually meant to help the people who are still alive yeah so can you give us some examples of any special requests you've been asked for oh there have been so many um so yes I've had family dog there I've had granddaughter playing the keyboard which was really lovely and us all singing along I've had quite a few sing-alongs I had a really lovely one where the wife of the person who died, she always used to sing ABBA songs to her husband. (laughs) Um, So we all sang an ABBA song. Um, Sometimes the settings have been really meaningful. Like uh, we were in a back garden um, 
that the guy who died, it was his daughter's back garden, and he was really, really happy there. It was like his favorite place. And he was uh, cremated at three o'clock at, in East, Eastbourne Creme, and he didn't want any family there. So it was an unattended cremation. And we had the service at three o'clock in the back garden. Sun was shining, birds were tweeting. We did a little candle ceremony. It wasn't a very formally structured service. Everybody just stood up and said a few things about um, dad, uncle, whoever he was to them. And it was just really, really, really lovely. Then I've had a, a big old shindig in a seedy bar for um, a guy who's a very well-known shoe designer. And um, he had a leopard skin hearse. And his wife and some of her friends painted his coffin with amazing pop art. Everybody got completely pissed, not me, because I was being <laughs> professional. <laughs> so when they had to carry the coffin back out to the hearse, they were all kind of wobbling about <laughs> with it. Um, and then she went to Hastings Crematorium the next day for a family-only committal, so just immediate family. And she said it was really lovely because they could read all the messages that all the pissed friends had written on the coffin yeah. <laughs> and um, listen to some music that her husband had loved. And that was that. Oh, the one I must tell you about was um, he, uh, he, he, didn't, he wanted his funeral... Uh, in the field behind his house. So his daughters made posters of the different parts of his life. So there was like a childhood poster and then a his young man poster and then his work. And we walked around and I had a, a section to read for each part of his life. And then when we got to the end, his coffin was there and it was on a forklift truck. So he was then lifted up above us all and we raised a toast to him we had oh. some fizz and then he went off in the Land Rover hearse and we all went back into the community center next to the field and then again they went the next day for a family only committal and again they said um that they loved reading all the messages the one thing they said was they would have liked to have taken photos so you yeah. work in a very difficult and sensitive sector dealing with people, you know, going through their darkest times, having lost a loved one. How do you then go home to your family and have a normal day? <laughs> well, it's really funny, isn't it? Because um, I'm a big crier in real life. <laughs> um, and when we, we used to be marriage registrars, Kate and I. So when we left uh, that job to become independent celebrants, I suppose weddings were foremost in our mind. Then we sort of thought, oh, this isn't a year round thing. It's only in the summer and it's only Saturdays. It's not really a full time job. Um, so let's train to be funeral celebrants, which we were both quite nervous about. I think we thought it's a really big responsibility. And, you know, are we going to be able to cope with it emotionally? And my husband was like, Oh, really you're gonna be a funeral celebrant it's like you cry at adverts um but there's something about uh holding space for other people that is very different to your own emotional attachment and I guess I've kind of thought you can't you can't hijack someone else's grief it's not fair to do that you know it's completely inappropriate um usually I'm kind of okay sometimes I will get in my car after a funeral drive off find the nearest lay-by and have a good old sob sometimes I come home and I just have to take the dog out into nature and kind of decompress but sometimes I have to go to sleep <laughs> This is quite, you know, carrying people's grief is quite tiring. Um, but Kate and I also, uh, because of the way we work and because we are very not pro cookie cutter funerals, um, we also kind of limit the number of funerals that we do. We don't want to be doing six to 10 funerals a week. I, I don't know how anyone could do that. 
So I would never do more than one or two funerals a week. That would be enough for me because I put so much into them and I work so closely with the people that I'm doing the funeral for that, yeah, I need to have the space between them because otherwise it's too much. And then we have weddings in the summer to bring us joy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's a nice balance. (laughs) It is, it is. Now, you say that one of the reasons you're so passionate about what you do is because of your own experience of loss with with the death of your dad when you were just 13. Yeah. You say this pretty much defined the rest of your life. Could you share a little bit more about this? Well, yes. I mean, if we are over a certain age (laughs) and we're around in 1981, you know, you might remember uh, there was no such thing as pastoral care. You know, school did not have pastoral care. That wasn't a thing. There was no such thing as counselling. There wasn't really much awareness of mental health. So I had had the most amazingly happy childhood. You know, I had parents who adored each other. Uh, I had parents who absolutely adored me and my siblings. I think they had eaten some kind of positive parenting cake. So they were just, you know, I had this idyllic happy childhood. And then my dad got a cancer diagnosis and within six months he was dead. It absolutely, well, you know, the destructiveness of grief. Um, It just ripped our world apart. And nothing was acknowledged, though, because there was no support. There was no pastoral care. So I had, I went to school the day my dad died. My mum had gone off to the hospital And my sister had said, oh, they've said he's deteriorating fast. And we went, oh, okay, what do we do? And we all put on our uniforms and went to school. (laughs) Didn't even think you can stay at home. So I was at school thinking, I think my dad's died. Um, Came home, and he had, uh, which was, of course, utterly devastating. And then my mum was like, do you think... Do you think you can have the rest of the week off? Is that what you... <laughs> I mean, literally, we didn't even know if you could... Could you be off school? Yeah, what's your excuse? Yes, dead dad. <laughs> and so I had the rest of the week off. And then when I went back to school, my friend said to me, um, oh, don't worry. They announced in assembly that your dad was dead and uh, said we all had to be nice to you. <laughs> and basically, you know, that was kind of it. My form tutor said to me, uh, Kate, can you come out here, please? And I walked out and she looked at her desk, did not make eye contact with me and said, um, if you need any help, you know where I am. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And just made it completely clear that the last thing she wanted to do was talk to me about my bereavement. So, you know, it it felt very like just the world's been, you know, exploded and now there's nothing. You just have to navigate this with nothing, with no support, with no compass, no map, no nothing at all. So I think, well, I know I was quite damaged for quite a long time. And then, you know, it was in adulthood that I had various bits of kind of counselling at different points in my life. I mean, what happened was when I was 16, I fell completely in love with a boy who was 18. And what we had in common was I had a dead dad and he had a dead brother. And I think we understood that kind of otherness we were very different to other people because this thing had happened to us particularly people of our age I mean 13 year olds they don't know what to do with you and you've just you know your dad's just died they're like this is not within my (laughs) yeah which is why all this stuff should be in school and it should be talked about because 
we don't have it in our toolbox. And the reason we don't have it is because we are completely, you know, we think it's not going to happen. We're in denial. We just, and we're not comfortable with it. And the way to get comfortable is to keep talking about it and to be exposed to it in one way or another, you know, because I tell you what, it's the only thing that's guaranteed, isn't it? Absolutely is. Now, 13 is such a tender age to lose a parent. So as a teenager, did you find your friends were unsure how to be around you? People not knowing what to say? How did, what, how, say. What, did, what did you do to navigate this time in your life? Well, I didn't. I was just in free fall. I think I was yeah. in free fall for a very long time. You know, I don't think there was a concept of... You know, we're talking about this in modern terms, like how did you na- navigate your grief? In 1981, that was not a concept that existed. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was like, um, your dad's died. Okay. You know, and I think all of us, you know, my mum was absolutely devastated. But I kind of didn't know that because my mum tried to hide that from us because that was the thinking at the time that you know you know you must be strong for the children and all that did was really confuse me because I was like I know they really loved each other but I'm not getting that she's as upset as I think she should be so I was confused you know and my sister and brother also we all just went into our own little cocoon my friends didn't say anything to me about it you know it just was never kind of alluded to again um which even that was kind of terrible because it was you know there's no acknowledgement that this thing has happened to me which is why I think me and my then boyfriend who stayed together for the best part of 15 years I think you know that was a lifeline for me and for him because there was this understanding and we didn't have to talk about it we just understood which was something that none of my peers because they were so young they just couldn't understand and you know and I think it was also kind of like you know well a year's gone by you must be all right now (laughs) you know and then kind of uh Many, many years later, when I was 45, and um, by this point, I was married to somebody else and had three kids, and I was going to be, he he was older than, two years older than me, my husband, and when he was going to be 45, I didn't let him be 45. I said he had to go straight to 46, and... I wasn't joking. You know, it sounds a bit insane, but I was deadly serious. I was like, I can't actually cope with you being 45. And by this point, I was 43. You know, so that's 30 years after I've been bereaved. I was really frightened by him being 45. Then when I turned 45, my oldest daughter was 13. I was 13 when my dad died, but I was actually the youngest child. But I started to completely unravel because of those numbers. I was like, I'll die. She'll die. Somebody will die. (laughs) And I went to my GP and um, she was like, oh, you know, what have you come to see me about? And I just burst into tears. And I was like, you know, I thought I was okay. I thought I'd dealt with this stuff. I've had some bits of counselling. But I'm clearly not okay. (laughs) So then I had some more counselling and was kind of a bit more okay than I had been. Um, But I think it has been a real work in progress because it wasn't dealt with. And I think I just carried it with me. And yeah, didn't kind of realise then. Then my husband, who's very kind of robotic, (laughs) he's he's at the other end of the emotional spectrum to me um and you know when I would tell him what my thoughts were he would just look at me like I was completely insane and then I did sort of think 
oh, do you know what? Maybe not everybody does think like me. Maybe not everybody, you know, every time the phone rings thinks it's going to be somebody has died. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've spent a lifetime working through it because it just it just wasn't dealt with. I think we react to trauma, don't we? And we carry that with us. And it's not that we're nuts. It's actually normal. It's normal to react to some hugely traumatic event. You would be weird if that didn't leave you impacted in some way or another. But I think because of the age I was, I didn't have the insight of somebody more mature because I hadn't had the life experience and my life had been a day at the beach until that point so I was also not very tough because I hadn't had to you know I hadn't had to deal with any adversity in my life so we've got a long way to go in this country when it comes to dealing and talking about grief and loss but like you say years ago (laughs) there was no help I mean, we've come some way, but we've still got a long way to go, haven't we? Yeah, I I completely concur. I think we have come some way. I mean, uh, I think if if a child fell off a mountain on a school trip, heaven forbid, I suspect the other children would be offered some kind of counseling. I would very much hope so. And I kind of think that is what would happen. But I do also think... There's a lot of lip service paid. You know, today is Mental Health Awareness Day, isn't it? And I think there's a lot of bandwagoning and every big organisation will jump on and say, oh, yes, you know, take care of your colleagues or whatever. But actually, it's more grassroots than that. It is about people when it comes to, to, you know, grief I'm talking about. um, You know, I have done a funeral for a woman who she lost both her adult sons within two weeks of each other both in unexpected tragic circumstances completely horrendous um she lived in a little cul-de-sac and she said I know my neighbor is like running in the house when she sees me come out I know she is avoiding me and that's utterly tragic because actually it would be better to say oh my god I don't know what to say to you you know I can't imagine what's going on for you it must be so horrendous and I don't know what to say yeah you know you're not gonna say you know being kind to the neighbor she probably didn't want to say the wrong thing you you can't say you can't make it any worse the very worst thing has happened (laughs) so I think it's um, we've lost we've lost some skills that we used to have, and we almost need to look back in order to look forward. Look back to the time when the older women of the village would do the midwifery and the laying out of the dead, and it was part of the ebb and flow of life. And if we can get back to that a little bit more, where we have a degree of comfortableness you know this thing of all oh, children they shouldn't go to the funeral yes they should go to the funeral yeah you know they absolutely should they should go and see dead granny uh you know they still do in ireland and they're all absolutely you know they're not all walking around traumatized um if we if we talked about this stuff and we were able to couch it in a way that you know we've explained fully what to expect because you know I didn't see my dad. I didn't see him. He just disappeared. And uh, uh, it's horrible. So Mm -hmm. I I think, yeah, there's still there's still a lot to do. Um, But I'm just, you know, part of that. There, There are a lot of really forward thinking people now, lots of deaf professionals who are really trying to open up these conversations. So that's kind of brilliant. So, yes. Do you recommend any books or films or groups to support people that are going through grief and loss? I don't know really because I didn't do any kind of reading of books or uh, support groups. I kind of did everything in a very individualistic 
holistic way. I mean, there are lots of organisations out there now. I think because I'm so funeral centric, I don't look at the what happens after. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I resonate actually a lot with what you were saying about, um, you know, grief as a 13 year old. I lost my brother when I was 11 and he went out to babysit and never came home, basically. And I had the Monday off school and the next day I went back to school. But I chose Mm -hmm. to because I needed to escape from all the sadness at home. (laughs) I needed to go back to school and have some sort of normality. But I didn't go to the funeral. It was almost like we never mentioned his name again. So we were scared of mentioning the name in case we upset mum and dad. And and it, it was so different. So when you were talking about your experience, I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was like back then. I know. And then yeah. for a child, that's just really confusing, isn't it? Yeah, you absolutely. just kind of, oh, that's awful. Yeah. So, Kate, what words would of wisdom could you share to maybe help someone loosen their grief in some way? I think um, I would say seek help immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any support right from the off. Even if it's just to go and sit in a counsellor's office and cry once a week, but, you know, to have the space to do that. I think, you know, resilience, yeah, it's great, isn't it? But equally, if something really terrible has happened to you, you need to acknowledge that that is a trauma and that you know you need support I'm quite interested in um I don't know quite know how you say it semantic semantic therapy which is like a more holistic approach because I think we hold things in our bodies as well as in our minds I think it's all kind of inseparable and uh I think that that's um, the way forward is to look at us more holistically. I work as an EFT practitioner, so we work with how do you feel? Where do you feel it? How intense is it? And it's um, about connecting to the messages that our bodies are constantly giving us and becoming aware of them and learning to process them and release and let them go. So, yes, um, I'm very much into that as well. But do you believe that your experience of grief has given you any gifts? Well, when I read that question, I I had to kind of think about it for a minute. Um, I'm a very pragmatic person. I'm really not very spiritual. <laughs> um, so... I sort of thought gifts, I don't know. What I thought was I would not be who I am because it was such a formative thing that happened to me. It defined me to a great degree for a very long time. So I suppose I quite like who I am. (laughs) And... In one of my many um, dips into counselling, I remember crying and saying, you know, if that hadn't happened to me, I would be a different person. And the counsellor saying to me, well, would you be a better, happier or nicer person? And I said, well, I don't know. I can never I can never know that. So then I sort of thought, God, I might have been awful. (laughs) I might have been, you know, a really horrible person because I hadn't had any sort of um, any grit to to rub up against. Um, So I sort of then chose to think perhaps I am a, you know, a nicer person. And I guess I'm very empathetic and yeah, and I do have an ability to talk about difficult things. Um, So I'm going to see those as my gift. Yes. Yes, I like that. So do you have any special ways to remember your dad or any family rituals? No. (laughs) No is the answer to that. When I saw that, I thought, oh, do you know, I, yeah, no, I don't. I find it very, uh, I don't know if difficult is the right word. Um, I suppose difficult because I've outlived him. So... I'm now 10 years older than he was when he died. And 
I was 13 and I'm now 55. So the numbers have all become a bit skewed because I'm now thinking about a man who was younger than me. Yeah. Within the family, for years, we didn't talk. Nobody talked about dad to me because I got so upset every time they did. Um, Since then, because I've become less upset, I can just about manage to talk about him. Um, We have had more conversations. And actually, my uncle Graham, when he died, I was really sad because he was the only person who talked to me about my dad. No, I don't. I have no rituals, but I have a few things. I have a few. I have his teddy bear. I have a pot that he made. So I have things that are meaningful to me because they're part of him. But I don't have any rituals because I'm not a ritually kind of a gal. No, well, that's beautiful what you do have. So what would you like people to learn from your experience of grief and loss? That it's shit. It's really shit. And, um, you know, it's shit, but it's part of the human experience. And that we should stop being in denial of that. And we should acknowledge that it is part of the human experience. Um, Because if we can do that just as part of life in the way that our ancestors would have done, the reality of death will be slightly less horrific for us. But death is horrible. It's horrible. And, you know, some people come through it better than others. But it's hard. It's really, really hard. And it's really, really shitty if you love that person, you know, and even if you didn't, you're left with all this unresolved stuff. The other thing I would say is that Kate and I, who, you know, we work with death every day, we never understand it anymore. We don't suddenly go, oh, go, oh yes, I get it now. <laughs> you know, that somebody can be alive and vibrant and full of life and then not exist it's just completely mind-blowing and it never stops blowing my mind so Kate what are your thoughts about an afterlife oh you know what I'm gonna say Louise (laughs) (laughs) um I don't believe in an afterlife I believe in the here and now and I I believe in living my best life because I believe this is the only chance I've got. This is my one opportunity. I don't think there's another chance in another realm. I also, again, this thing about ages, I struggle with afterlife and about, you know, oh, I get to meet all my dead rallies because I think that, I'll be older than my dad or do I then go back to being 13 and he's 45 and my mum who's now 88 where does she fit in and she then remarried and he's dead as well so what's going to happen there and um, so I think because I'm such a realist and so pragmatic those things because they don't make sense to me I just I can't buy into it so um, yeah and because I don't have a religion um, you know, it's not part of something that I've been brought up believing. I just don't believe it. So, yeah, <laughs> so, no. yeah. so that's what I think about the afterlife. It does I love, exist. I love your <laughs> answer. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think about people? Well, you can that... laugh at me when you meet me up there and go, ha <laughs> <laughs> No, I would never do that. <laughs> but what do you think about people who believe there is an afterlife and they believe they've had signs. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think it must be incredibly reassuring. It must be lovely. Um, And part of me is a little bit jealous. I think, you know, wouldn't it be lovely to, to think I might see my dad again and feel okay with that? Whereas I just find that a bit creepy and weird (laughs) for the reasons I've just stated. (laughs) When I got married, it had rained all week and then it it dried up just in time for my 
wedding, which was an outside do. And I sort of thought, oh, my dad's done that for me. But really, no, that was just meteorological. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then my daughter was very, very ill a few years ago. And I kept seeing a robin in the garden. And part of me wanted again to go, oh, that's my dad coming to keep an eye on me because I'm having a really hard time. But the other part of me was like, well, no, it's just a robin. Your atheist hat started to slip there for a moment. Yes, it did, <laughs> just slightly. And then I wedged it firmly back on my head. <laughs> so, Kate, if you could give your dad a message now, what would you say? Well, you see, I wouldn't, because <laughs> okay. that makes me feel weird. And okay. um, I actually, I said that to my husband today. I, I read him that question and I said, is it is it weird that I don't want to give him a message because I don't I think that just makes me feel really peculiar (laughs) no I I know I love talking to atheists because you're just so accepting that death is the end that's it it's almost let's move on and you can get a lot of comfort from that which is fantastic I think I, you know, I I walk my dog in nature every day and my dad loved walking the dog in nature with me when I was a kid. And I kind of think I'm close to him then. I'm close to him in the trees and I see willow herb, which was his favourite wildflower. I don't need to think he is literally existing in that. I just need to know that he's there in my heart and in that place and through my genetics and my memory of him and that's that's enough for me it's making me Uh, want to cry (laughs) oh I love that I love that and I think on that note Kate we'll finish here Thank you so much for being my guest today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been really lovely to have a little delve and to to think about why you do think the way you think has been yeah. quite interesting. Why I think the way I think. I think the way you think is interesting as well. And it's been absolutely <laughs> beautiful. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of A Gift for Grief. Please feel free to share it with your friends and family and let's encourage others to become more grief literate. If you're struggling with your grief or worried about your mental health, please do speak to your doctor. If you would like to join me on my social media groups, check out the show notes for all the links and I look forward to connecting with you next time. The music on this podcast was written and recorded by Matthew Bates and can be found on his two albums, Fight Back and Kaleidoscope.